Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at our private banks. So, okay, switching gears a little bit, we're taking a look at private banks, which are private profit maximizing firms. So, right, that's a big thing to keep in mind is that they're operating, they are working, not in the best interest of the macro economy on whole, not in the best interest of you necessarily, but in the best interest of themselves to maximize their own profits. So in this, they are private actors and they actually play a fundamental role in the creation of money. And we'll take a look at that. We'll actually take a look at the fact that it's not really the central bank or the Bank of Canada that creates money, but actually these private banks. And what we'll do is we'll actually kind of, just to be clear as to who we're talking about, because there's lots of different actors out there, is we won't refer to them as banks or private banks, because then it gets confusing. Are we talking about the Bank of Canada or bank as in private banks? We'll refer to these institutions as either financial institutions or more accurately as financial intermediaries. So what we're going to be taking a look at, our goals as we move through this video, is we will recognize, as we've already said, that these financial intermediaries are profit-maximizing firms. And that will explain how these financial intermediaries earn their profit. We will then explain the role in the great scheme of our macroeconomy, and we will explain how they create and destroy money through what is known as the fractional reserve banking. And we've actually already talked about this fractional reserve banking briefly a few videos back when we were talking about our history of money. So you already kind of had a bit of an insight into this. Finally, to wrap up this video, we will actually compute the money supply and we'll talk again about a few different measures of our money supply and kind of how we could measure and determine what that money supply is. So let's go jump over. Let's take a look and we'll start off by taking a look at really, hey, these financial intermediaries are profit maximizing. And we'll talk about how they're profit maximizing, how they make their money. So let's go jump over and take a look at that. So profit maximization. Ah. Profit maximizing financial intermediaries. FI, financial intermediaries. These are our banks that we deal with. And I say banks, but these are our banks, our credit unions, our case de populaire. These are all of our institutions out there that take money, take money on deposit, and uh, that helps if I can write, take money on deposit and issue loans so all of our institutions out there and there's many of them that act in this way that take your money give you some small interest rate on your savings account your checking account even maybe and then they also write and issue loans on the other side well these profit maximizing financial institutions this here as i have laid out is actually exactly how they make their money exactly how they would aim to maximize or to even earn profit and that is what they're going to do is they are going to earn their revenue based off of these margins. So how exactly do these margins work for the bank to actually make money to earn any profit at all? Well, right as, as we're aware, we have with our deposits, money we put on deposit at the bank, we earn a really, really low interest rate these days. This would actually be a high interest rate. Let's say that, hey... You and I, for every $100 we put at the bank, we get a 1% interest rate on that. If you've taken a look at your savings accounts or anything like that, 1% would be a dream. Uh, most savings accounts these days are at like 0 0.05 of a percent. Pretty, pretty small. On the flip side of that, let's say that the bank then goes and they write loans and they lend out money. And keep in mind, really the money they're lending out is your money that they took on deposit. They are lending that back out and they write a higher interest rate for these loans. And let's say they lend this out at 4%. 
Well, in this case here, they have a spread between these two rates of 3%, which is going to be their profit margin, what they actually end up getting to earn off of that. They have their cost of credit that they have to pay for the deposit money they take, and then they get their revenue of their 4%. So, A, to take a look at it from a simple case, let's say this was $100 on deposit that was then $100 lent out. Not exactly how it would work, but it just makes our numbers nice. Well, let's see how this would work, right? We would have a cost here of $1. We would have a revenue here of $4, meaning our profit in this case, our cost of funds, our revenue from our funds, our profit altogether would be 3% on this $100. We would earn $3 just by taking the money in and then writing the loan and lending it out to somebody else. So again, ultimately these banks are just profit maximizing institutions really making money off the spread between their deposits, their liabilities, and their money lent out, their loans, their assets on the other side. Okay, that's how the banks work. That is how they make their money as profit maximizing agents. Let's talk about the role. The roles of these financial institutions or these financial intermediaries. Roles of FI, again, FI being our private banks, our financial intermediaries. The first big role that we attribute to them is that they, well, they provide credit. That's really our big one, our provision of credit. And this is, this is actually pretty important because Credit is the lifeblood of the modern economy. It allows us to overcome our intertemporal kind of limitations that, hey, in the future I might be earning lots of money, but today I don't have very much money. Ah, if only there is some way that I could take my future money in order for me to be, to be able to eat something today. Well, that's what credit is, right? It allows us to be able to borrow from our future income in order to be able to smooth our consumption over time, in order to be able to take that future high income, move some of it to today so that I can move some of that really high future consumption towards today's consumption. In that way there, I'm decreasing my future consumption, but I'm raising my present consumption and I can be better off over my lifetime as a result of that if if I can kind of make proper decisions with that, right? We definitely see some people not necessarily acting in the most rational of ways. And of course, they bury themselves in debt. That is, maybe they have this unrealistic expectation of their future income, or maybe they just don't fully understand how exactly this repayment works, right? So there's, of course, some imperfections in that. Big thing, though, is that, hey, for banks to be a provider of credit, and this provision of credit is one of their biggest roles, their biggest functions that we want to consider, in order for this to be able to happen, they need to have a fractional reserve system. And what exactly does this mean? Again, we've talked about a fractional reserve system when we talked about our history of money, but really what this means is that Say we have a deposit of $100, so $100 comes into the bank. Well, the bank is only going to keep on reserve. This is the amount that they actually keep in their vault, so to say. They will only keep in reserve some fraction of the full deposit. Let's just pick an amount. Let's say that they keep on reserve only $5. So out of that whole $100 put on deposit, the bank actually only keeps $5 of it. They then lend out the other 95. So, right, we have 100, we have 100. The two are going to equal because, well, the entire amount deposited is going to be split between the amount we keep in our vault and the amount we lend out to others. So how does this work, right? What if you go back to the bank and say, 
Hey, I want my full hundred dollars back today, please. Uh oh, the bank only has five dollars. Well, as we talked about, the reason why this works is because on any typical day, if we kind of imagine this as being our big vault, there's like your big spinning wheel, almost looks like a boat wheel, maybe. That's your big lock, your safe lock, in order to protect all the money that's inside. Well, okay, we have all of our money sitting inside of there. On any given day, typically, the amount of money coming in on deposit roughly equals the amount of money coming out in withdrawals. So, hey, on any given day, ah, these two balance each other out roughly, meaning that the amount of money sitting there in this vault is relatively static, relatively constant. It's not fluctuating very much meaning that the bank doesn't actually need to keep your full hundred dollars in reserve because if you wanted your full hundred dollars back out, they could give you your hundred dollars back out with somebody else's deposit that just came in. So that's our idea. That's our basis. As a result of this, we only need to keep a little bit of money in these vaults and we can lend the rest out. That's that 95 being lent out to others, our creation of credit. And we'll actually see with this that this creation of credit actually also is a creation of money. And we'll talk about that. We'll formally explicitly take a look at that very, very soon. What's our other big role of financial institutions though? So provision of credit, that's, that's our first big role. Our second big role, and we're not gonna talk too much about that in this course, is our interbank activities. These interbank activities, we're not going to talk about them too much here, but they're actually massive in implication for our greater economy. And these are things like our facilitation of our payment systems. <clears throat> so, hey, the fact that we can buy and sell stuff with debit cards rather than carrying around large amounts of cash, pretty vital. Even before that, the fact that we could buy or sell things with check rather than carrying around physical cash. Again, very vital, removes a lot of the frictions to buy and sell goods and services greatly increasing commerce on whole. As we increase commerce, we increase economic activity, we increase our total economic output, thus GDP. So these interbank activities, debit, credit, check clearing, wire transfers, e-transfers, all of these are pretty vital to a smoothly functioning economy. Okay, so that's our roles of financial institutions financial intermediaries. Let's go and let's talk about this whole fractional reserve banking in a little bit more detail. And let's specifically take a look at how this creation of credit ultimately leads to a creation of money. So let's jump over and take a look at that. Okay, so for to take a look at this creation of credit and this creation of money, let's start off with some basic assumptions. And for these assumptions, we will relax them a little bit as we move on. But to introduce the topic, well, we put a lot of restrictive assumptions on just to make it easier to grasp, easier to explain, and easier to visualize. So our first assumption is that we have to assume through this modeling process that we are either dealing with a, we'll go monopoly bank, a monopoly financial intermediary. And what I mean by that is that this is the only bank, the only financial intermediary in the entire economy. Alternatively, because you're like, okay, that's a little bit of a ridiculous assumption. Alternatively, we can view this as kind of an aggregated view of every financial intermediary within the economy. So however you want to view that, is entirely fine, right? Whether it be one bank that's kind of the monopoly over the entire banking system, or we're just kind of aggregating the balance sheets of every single financial intermediary to look at the aggregated balance sheet. Both work out the same. We just kind of have to have this very aggregate view of our banking system on whole. So first assumption that needs to be made. Second assumption, and this will be the one that we will relax, is that we are in a cashless society. So we have a cashless system. That is, there's no physical cash at all. 
all money is electronic money, all money is deposit money. So bit of an assumption to be made. One assumption that, well, maybe we're working towards as a society, right? Every year we seem to be using less and less cash, but one assumption that we will relax and we will bring cash into the equation once we kind of understand the workings of the system, because cash does complicate things a little bit. What we need to do in order to be able to evaluate this is we need to be able to take a look at this Monopoly Bank's balance sheet or T table. And in this, what we're going to have is on the left hand side, we're going to have the bank's assets and we'll put these in dollars and we're going to have the bank's liabilities. And again, these are in dollars. So liabilities, what the bank owes to other people, assets, uh, that's their revenue generating. This is the instruments, the money that they actually have that is earning them. So two different sides of this. Of course, these two sides have to balance. They're always going to balance. That's why it's a balance sheet. We're going to be taking a look at a very, very simplified version of a bank balance sheet. And to start off on the liability side, all we're going to have over here are the deposits. So why are deposits a liability to the bank? Well, deposits are a liability to the bank. And this is backwards because a lot of people are like, well, hey, no, my deposits at a bank, those are my assets. Well, you're right. They're your assets, but it's money you've lent to the bank. It's money that you could go to the bank today and say, excuse me, I want my money back. So in that case there, from the bank's perspective, your deposits are a liability. And let's suppose that this bank has total deposits of 100. And right, maybe let's give this some context. Maybe this is like 100 million altogether. Maybe we're talking about millions of dollars. We don't need to put that in, but maybe you need it just so it you know becomes a little bit more real. So, okay, on our liability side, we would then total that. And we would get a total liability of 100. We have to have things balanced. So on the left-hand side, we will also have a total of 100. But what causes this total of 100? Well, for the bank's assets, again, this is simplified. They would have a lot more than just deposits as liabilities. And again, they're going to have a lot more than what we're going to list as assets. But these are going to be the big ones that end up influencing our greater economy in a simplified way. So that is, we're going to presume that the bank has reserves and they have loans. And for this bank here, we're going to presume that they are carrying around $10 from this 100 as reserve. So, hey, all their deposits are valued at 100. They're only carrying around 10 in the vault, in their safe to keep it safe. What did they do with the rest? Well, the other 90, the other 90, they lent out to other people. So we would have our initial kind of our starting situation here of the bank. And then from here, we want to take a look at a few different ratios. So first ratio we want to take a look at is what is known as our reserve ratio. And what our reserve ratio is, is the ratio of how much we hold as reserves to our level of deposits. So our reserve ratio, it can always be calculated as our reserves over deposits. So for this bank right here that we're looking at, we would have a reserve ratio of 10%, 0 0.10, right? 10 over 100. Okay, so that's our reserve ratio. And the reserve ratio is what actually is. Taking our actual reserves versus our actual deposits, and we get our reserve ratio. Outside of our reserve ratio, we would also have what's known as our target or desired reserve ratio. I tend to refer to this as our target reserve ratio. And what that is, is going to be our target reserves to deposits. And that is 
and not necessarily what we actually have as reserves, but how much we would want to hold as reserves to our deposits. And in this case here, this is going to be based off of kind of liquidity concerns for the bank. Because if we take a look at this, if we take a look at this, our reserves and our deposits are the two liquid aspects. That is, if all of a sudden somebody comes along and says, hi, I would like to take out $5. Well, this guy drops to 95, right? We go 95, 95. How does that translate through? Well, you don't take this $5 withdrawal out of the loans. You don't say, hey, I know we gave you some money for your car, but we need that money back right now. No, 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 no. This $5 withdrawal comes from our reserves. These are the two liquid aspects. These are the two that instantly react to one another. So reserves would drop and we would have, again, everything balancing out. So in order, to ensure, in order to ensure that we have enough liquidity, enough reserves in order to meet kind of these large withdrawal requests, we would have some target reserve ratio out there, some minimum level of reserves that we want to hold with respect to deposits. In this scenario, let's just back up and get rid of all this yellow that we did just to kind of take a look at our hypothetical situation. In this scenario, let's presume that this bank is starting off in a situation such that they are also at their target reserve ratio, right? So again, we'll presume that our target reserve ratio is also 10% and that, hey, the bank's happy. Their actual reserves are one and the same as their target reserves. We're good. We're happy. We don't need to do any kind of changing of things in order to meet liquidity concerns. Interesting side note. So here we have this target reserve or desired reserve of 10%, meaning we want to hold 10% of all of our deposits in our safe just in case we get a withdrawal. Do you think there's actually a minimum reserve requirement in Canada or in the U.S. for that matter? And what do you think that minimum reserve requirement might be? Is 10% too high? Is 10% too low? Is it actually closer to 25%? Is it actually closer to one? In reality, there is no regulated reserve ratio. There is nothing done for reserve ratios by governments, by the central bank, telling our private banks what minimum reserve ratio they have to hold. This here, this target reserve ratio is entirely determined in house by the banks themselves, by the private banks, these financial intermediaries. It's not dictated to them. They're not told you must maintain at least this amount of reserves. The banks determine this entirely on their own. Keeping in mind, right, part of profit maximization is you don't want to go bankrupt. You don't want to go under. So banks will tend to maintain enough liquidity on their own that it's not really a focus of regulation. There are other focuses of regulation for sure, but outside of the scope of Econ 104 for sure. So just kind of an interesting insight there. A lot of people are blown away by this fact that there is actually no legal minimum as to the amount of reserves that a bank has to hold. They could technically take your entire $100 and throw it all into a loan. Not very prudent, but the bank could. Okay, then. We have this idea, we have our reserves, we have our target reserves. Let's talk about what happens then if we get new money into this banking system. And if we get new money into this banking system, what ends up happening? Well, let's talk about what exactly we mean by new money, right? And our new money, let's, let's put this up here because we have a little bit of space. New money could be from a few different sources. So this new money could be new from the Bank of Canada. That is, the Bank of Canada has gone and just printed a bunch of money and they've put it on deposit, right? They've said, here you go, Bank XYZ, we're going to put a bunch of money on deposit with you. Alternatively, it could have been 
Um, that's not an M. Uh, money. That was not in circulation. So this happens from time to time. Grandma doesn't trust the banks, took a large sum of money and has squirreled it away in her wall, under her mattress, in her safety deposit box, something like that. Once this money comes back into the economy, actually gets put on deposit, well, now all of a sudden it's new money that's now again new in circulation. So money that was out of circulation, that's coming back into circulation, would be new money. Finally, it could be money from abroad. From abroad. It could be foreign money coming in and being put on deposit. So wherever this new source of money comes from, keeping in mind right now we're dealing with this idea of a cashless society, so it would have to be a direct transfer in, deposit to deposit. Well, let's suppose that through some mechanism, let's suppose through some mechanism we all of a sudden get a injection of money into here such that we get plus 100 of new deposits. Okay, so hey, all of a sudden I found a bunch of money underneath, like massive amounts of money. This is the entire deposits at the entire bank. I've just doubled their deposits. Grandma had a lot of money squirreled away. We're putting it all into the bank now. Well, how exactly does this work out? What does this work out to do? Well, let's go take a look at the immediate effect. Let's take a look at the immediate effect. Let's redraw our T table here. Okay. So we're going to have our assets. We're going to have our liabilities. Our deposits, they were 100. They got scaled up by another 100. So our deposits are now 200. Deposits, reserves, those are the two liquid aspects of it. So my reserves jump up to 110. My loans, my loans, I don't have time to write or to call loans, so my loans stay the same. And those are still at 90. Meaning altogether my totals are still 200 and 200. Good sign, I balance, right? Always need to balance. Well, what has happened here? Well, as we go through, our target reserve ratio is still at 10%. But our reserve ratio, that is our actual reserve ratio, that's at 110 over 200. 110 over 200. My actual reserves are at 55%. For the bank, this is problematic. Keeping in mind, our bank is profit maximizing and the way they make their profit, the way they make their money is on the spread between what they pay on deposits and what they earn on loans. Meaning this money sitting in reserves is not earning any revenue. It's not getting any interest. This is idle money. So that is there's an opportunity cost to having these excess reserves, right? And having excess, right? We could we can make a new one. We could call these excess reserves, which is, hey, how much we actually have above our target. Well, in this case here, our excess reserves would be at about 45%, right? Excess reserves to deposits. Excess reserves to our deposits. Right, and so our excess reserve ratio, ah, there we go, excess reserve ratio, ERR, would be 0.45 if we wanted to think about that case there. Don't really need to worry about excess reserves. Our big one there would be total, sorry, target reserve ratio, TRR, and our actual reserve ratio, RR. Big takeaway right now, though, is that we do have too much excess reserves that are not earning us any income. We need to fix this. We're profit maximizing. We need to shift all of this extra money we have sitting into our safe into loans. And this takes time. We need to find people who want loans. We need to market these loans. Say, hey, look, we're having a loan sale. Come in, we'll waive the underwriting fee or something like that. We need to get this money out the door. This takes time. We need to underwrite it. We need to make sure that it's good credit risk. We need to go through all that. But what will eventually happen is that we will update 
our sheet. Now let's use the right tool to make this look a little bit prettier. There we go. We will update our balance sheet. So liabilities, there's no change in deposits. Those are still 200. No change, well, there will be a change in reserves. Let's take a look at what's happening over on our asset side. So we've had all these excess reserves. We want to lend them out. So we're going to take all of that excess reserve. We're going to lend all that excess out into loans such that our reserve ratio is once again equal to our target reserve ratio. So, okay, again, we have a target reserve ratio of 10%. So what's 10% of 200? We would want our reserves to be 20. If our reserves are 20, well, how much are we lending out altogether? Well, keep in mind the two sides have to balance. So 20 plus something is 200. We would have loans of 180, meaning that we have just moved... How much have we just moved? We've just moved $90 into loans. We've taken $90 out of our reserves. We have lent out $90. We've just doubled our amount of loans altogether. So there we go. Again, we have this situation where the bank is happy. Our reserve ratio equals our target reserve ratio. We are profit maximizing once again. We're carrying that minimum amount of reserves around to keep our liquidity constraints being satisfied. And we're making good income off of our loans and paying out our costs for our deposits, maximizing our profit based off of this spread. But wait, 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 story's not actually done yet. We have our two assumptions. We have our assumption that this balance sheet that we're showing here, this T-table, this is either for a monopoly financial intermediary, meaning this represents the only bank within this economy, or it's the aggregated balance sheet of every bank, meaning that, hey, these reserves of 20, this deposit of 200, these loans of 180, that is all the deposits within our economy, all the reserves held within our economy, all the loans issued within our economy. So, hey, wait a minute. We just issued $90 worth of loans, right? We just did plus 90 to our loans. If you get a loan, Say you need to go buy a new car, you go, you get a loan, you have that money, you've now bought that car, the person who sold that car now has that money. If it's a cashless society, they're going to take that $90 that they've just received from your loan, they now have that 90 they are going to go and put that on deposit. Right? And, just, and just we have to think about this. In a cashless society, this represents the entire banking system. That $90 loan that you just received, you've used that to go buy something. As you've bought something, you've given that $90 to somebody else. That somebody else now takes that $90 and puts it in the bank. So as they put that in the bank, well, what begins to happen? Let's go take a look. They go, they take that $90, they put it in the bank. We're going to again have our assets and our liabilities. Our deposits are going to jump up to, they were at 200, we get plus 90. Our deposits are now going to be at 290. We're going to have our reserves, we're going to have our loans. All together, these have to equal 290. Let's keep in mind what's happening here. Loans cannot change quickly. Loans are slow to react. Reserves are quick to react. Reserves and deposits are liquid to initially match each other. So plus 90 deposit was also plus 90 to reserves. So reserves of 20 plus 90 brings me back to a reserves of 110. Hey, same, same as I had there. 110. 290, difference between that, 290 minus 110 should be our 180. And that really ought to be the case because, well, everything needs to balance. And our loans did not change. Only reserves and deposits did. Okay, so we made a loan, we issued this loan. And then the money came back to us on deposit. The money we lent out to other people, the money that we gave out, is now coming back in as a deposit. 
That is, this money that has come back on a deposit is now reinflating our reserves. And as a result of it, well, okay, we are still going to have our target reserve ratio of 10%, but our reserve ratio is now all thrown off again. Right? Our reserve ratio, in this case, reserves over deposits, so 110 over 290. Our reserve ratio is now going to be something like uh, almost 38%, 37.93%. We're just going to go 38%, 0.38. So right again, I'm going to have excess reserves. I have too much money being held here as reserves. That carries an opportunity cost. This is money that I could be earning an interest rate on if I lent it out. So profit maximizing bank, profit maximizing financial institution, financial intermediary. What do they do? They take these excess reserves and they move them into loans. They begin to write new loans Again, this takes time. This is a process. And as we do so, we get our new updated balance sheet. So, assets, liabilities, no change to deposits in this case. We're still at 290. Reserves, loans, those guys are going to change, but we're still balanced at 290. We're going to lend out all of our excess such that our reserves are just equal to our target reserve. So 10% of 290, that's going to be 29. Our loans then is going to be the difference. 29 plus what equals 290? Well, we can figure that out. 290 minus 29 is 261. Meaning, what have we just done? We used to have 180 in loans. We now have 261 in loans. We've just gone and we've written $81 worth of new loans. What begins to happen then? These $81 of new loans then go out to buy cars. The seller of the cars now gets that money. That money then goes back on. Uh, that does not look like an 81. Let's try that again plus 81 of new deposit. And then we'd have it updated again. As it updates again, we'd have that coming back in on deposit, right? Let's, this will be our final case, I promise. I promise we're not gonna do this all the way to infinity because that's, that's actually technically what's happening. Liabilities, assets, our deposits are going to be 290 plus 81. We're gonna have new deposits of 371. 371. Reserves. Reserves are also going to increase by 81. So, okay, 29 plus 81 equals 110. Oh, hopefully we're seeing a common theme here. Based off that initial new deposit, our reserves go to 110. Reserves go to 110. Reserves go to 110. Loans. Loans don't change. Loans are at 261. Such that 110 and 261 gives me 371. I'm balancing. I'm good. Again, my target reserve ratio is still 10%. My reserve ratio there, my actual reserves, this is my reserves over my deposits. What is that guy? 110 over 371 gives me a new actual reserve ratio of almost 30%. Uh, 0.2973, so we'll go 30%. So what we see is that reserve ratio of 55, reserve ratio of 38, reserve ratio of 30. In each of these increment steps, my reserve ratio is falling. In each of these increment steps, $100 in new deposits, $90 in new deposits, $81 in new deposits. Down and down and down we go. This process will continue. It's technically an infinite sum until it finally approaches zero. It is an infinite sum approaching zero. Every time we add a new number, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Our kind of takeaway, our kind of saving grace in this is that we can recognize that our reserves always return to 110 with every deposit. As our reserves return to 110 with every deposit, our deposits grow 100 to 200, 200 to 290, 290 to 371, on and on and on and on. We can take advantage of all this 
they kind of go, okay, we're spiraling through our infinite sums. We're going to end up at a final stable solution such that assets, liability, reserves, deposits, loans, the two are going to be equal. What are going to be these values? Well, the one we can start off with, the one that we can be sure of, because, right, why are we sure of it? Reserves always returned to 110. After every deposit, we wound up back at 110. So our reserves will again be 110. Our deposits then, this is our final kind of case. So our deposits are going to be a point such that our reserve ratio equals our target reserve ratio. We don't have any excess reserves to lend out anymore. That is this 110 on reserve is that 10% of our deposits. So, okay, we can do that. We can go 110 divided by 10% to give us 1100, right? Such that, hey, 110 is 10% 10 of 1100. Our reserve ratio equals our target reserve ratio. Target reserve ratio of 10%, and we would get a reserve ratio of 10% as well. Well, okay, from that, we can work this out. Our liabilities equal 1,100 altogether. Well, 1,100 minus our reserves of 110 means that I have loans of 990. That has to be the case because these two sides have to balance. Okay, so what has just happened? What has just happened? Well, if we live in this cashless society, as we talked about, if we have this cashless society, then we have this situation here that all of our money is deposit money. So our deposits equals our money supply. This entire amount on deposit is one and the same as the total amount we have in our money supply. Because all we have for money is just deposit money. We have a cashless society. So that is, we can take a look at it and we could say to start off, our deposits equals money supply was $100. That's what we started off as. We saw, we just got some new money coming in. And you're like, okay, there we go. Extra $100. Our deposits double. Our money supply doubles. Cool. End of story, right? No, 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 no. We cycled through this whole process of fractional reserve banking, deposits, excess reserves, lending it out. Deposits, excess reserves, lending it out. Deposits, excess reserves, lending it out. Continuing, continuing, continuing. We end up, so money supply initial was 100. Money supply one is now my new deposits of 1100. That is, what did we just witness? We witnessed a plus 100 deposit paused plus 1000 in the money supply. That is a doubling of our deposits caused a tenfold increase in our money supply. That's massive, right? And this is really what we're talking about when we're saying that it's these private banks that really control the money creation or alternatively the money destruction process. And let's, let's talk about that for a bit. The, we can always solve it this way, but hey, this, this is a lot of work, right? This is a lot of work. There's actually, there's actually a bit of a cheat that we can utilize for this. And that is we can say that our new deposit right so our final amount after everything's changed or we can go yeah let's go like this change in deposit so how much our deposits have changed by is going to be equal to our new deposits times one over our target reserve ratio so, okay, 
to see, hey, does this actually work? Let's let's work it out. Our new deposits, that was plus 100 times one over our target reserve ratio. Our target reserve ratio was 0.1, so that's one over 0.1. That is, that is, if we work that out, one over 0.1, that's 10. So 100 times 10, that gives us a change in deposits. Change in deposits is equal to a thousand. A change in deposits, that is change in money supply in this cashless society, right? Deposits, money supply, one and the same. If we have no cash, we see we see how that works out. So we have our result there. So where we've just seen a money creation process, how a change in new deposits can filter through with our, let's give this guy a special name here. We'll call this guy our deposit multiplier. We've seen how, hey, new money coming in, some new deposit coming in, will get multiplied by our deposit multiplier through this excess reserve lending out back on deposit process to cause a much larger change in our total deposits, we can of course witness the same thing happen in reverse. We can witness a destruction of money rather than a creation of money through a withdrawal. And we're not gonna go through reworking out the whole process, but we can imagine it, we can walk through, talk through it with what we've already talked about. Say we have some of our deposits withdrawn. If we have some of our deposits withdrawn, well, our reserves are going to be lower than our target reserve ratio, right? We're going to have not enough in our reserves compared to what we would desire to have. So what we're going to have to do is as time goes through, we're going to have to call some of our loans. That is some of these loans that we've issued, we're going to have to say, hey, we're not renewing it, right? Maybe it's like, hey, we'll renew it every year for you. This time we're saying, no, sorry, we're not. Or sometimes it might just be, some loans, in fact, a lot of loans are technically callable, which means that the bank could come to you at any point and say, hey, I know we said it's a five-year car loan, but you need to pay back the entire amount today. And you'd have to come up with the money. So this stuff technically does happen. It's very rare to happen. Um, we don't get to see the full story in our balance sheet because we only have reserves and liabilities. Typically, there are other assets the bank can draw from in order to satisfy this reserve shortfall rather than just calling their loans. But in our simple case, that's their only option. So they'd have to call their loans. Their loans would decrease. As their loans decrease, well, how did people repay these loans? Well, they repaid their loans by pulling money out of their deposits. As they pulled money out of their deposits, well, their reserves decreased. Is there right and this would continue 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 downwards destroying your deposits destroying your money until you wind up at a final point in that case there same same formula that we would use to figure out the change in deposits and we can just calculate in this case here let's say what happens change in deposits if rather than a new deposit we have a new withdrawal just a negative deposit right Let's say that we have $5 removed, right? So you go in and you're like, I want a $5 withdrawal, please. Well, that minus five all over one over our target reserve ratio, that's 0 0.10. That's gonna be our change in deposits will be negative five times one over 0.1. We already worked out our deposit multiplier to be 10. Our change in deposits will be negative 50. Meaning if we work that guy out, we work that guy out, our new deposits, our new value, sorry, I shouldn't say new deposits. We don't have new money coming in. I'll call this D prime, right? The new value of deposits at the bank. If we wanted, ah, actually, let's just go about it this way. I'm thinking about this too much. Let's just create the new T table. Let's take a look at what it looks like. Liabilities. Assets, deposits. Well, we started off with, let's go all the way up here. We started off with deposits of 100. Out of that 100, we had $5 that were withdrawn and never came back. It left our system altogether. It's no longer in circulation. Somebody left the country with this $5. Uh, sorry, 
left the country with that $5, that $5 withdrawal got multiplied such that our change in deposits was minus 50. So our new deposit, 100 minus 50, gives me 50. So my total liabilities is 50. We're presuming that this is at that stabilized point, right? This is this formula goes from the starting all the way to the end. And so our reserves are going to be at our target reserves. So 10% of our deposits, our reserves will be 5, meaning our loans will be 45. And again, we would have balance. So we see in this way here that any change in our deposits in this cashless society will be influenced through this deposit multiplier due to fractional reserve banking and will either cause a multiplication up in our creation of money or that withdrawal causing that multiplication down and a destruction of money. We see here, right, our new deposits or our new money supply falls by 50 to a new value of 50. We'll call that money supply prime. And all that was just simply because we took $5 out of our system. Over here, we added plus $100 and our money supply prime went up to 1100. So massive changes being had just from relatively small changes in our deposits. Okay. What happens if we relax our assumptions? What happens if we introduce cash into our system? Right? So here we had the assumption of a cashless society. What if we relax that assumption? Let's let's take a look at another example. And just to kind of keep it somewhat consistent, let's go and we'll say for our starting condition here, we have our liabilities, we have our assets. We'll say we have our deposits of 100, reserves of 10, and loans of 90. So we have 100 equals 100. We're balanced. We're happy. And we'll additionally say that our target reserve ratio is 10%. What we're also going to include, though, is we're going to include another term. And what this is known as is our currency ratio, or also known as our cash carry rate. And that is the amount of cash, right? That's physical cash or physical bills of money that people tend to carry as a proportion of their deposits. So that is, if we set this to be, let's say, 15%, that is, okay, if we have $100 on deposit, I tend to also be carrying around 15% of that as cash. So in this case, if we want to take a look at my money supply, my money supply would be all my deposit money plus all my actual cash that I'm carrying. So in this case here, our initial money supply, we could work that out. We have $100 in deposit, and then we tend to carry around 15% of our deposits as cash. So 15% of 100 would be 15. My initial money supply in our case here would be $115. So let's, let's save that just so we can refer to it. We'll throw it up here, and I'll go money supply not for my initial case. And we'll just delete that work through just so we have space as we work through everything else. Okay, from here, let's work through the exact same scenario. Let's suppose that we have this increase in our deposits by plus 100 of new deposit. So again, maybe this is the Bank of Canada comes along and says, here we go. Here is an extra $100 on deposit. There you go, bank. Go from there. Okay. So what, what happens? Extra $100 on deposit. Well, liabilities, deposits, 100, assets, reserves, loans. Ah, uh, sorry, what am I doing? What am I doing? We already have 100. I'm just doing the same situation again. New of 100, so deposits plus 100. Deposits are 200. Reserves are now going to jump up to 110. 
The loans are going to jump up to 90. We have 200. We have 200. Okay, right? It's, it's looking the same. It's looking like not much, not much is different at all. Well, let's let's go through uh, let's go through a few iterations of this and see what happens. So, first iteration: loans, assets, reserves. Uh, sorry, liabilities, assets, reserves, loans, deposits. Well, this guy is still two hundred. This guy's going to drop down to our target reserve ratio, right? Ten percent of our deposits, so twenty. With that excess, that other 90 being lent out. So we're going to have 180 in loans, giving us 200 and 200. Okay, this is where things start to change. We had this plus 100 going directly into new deposits. Now, we have this new amount here. We had, what did we get? Our loans went up by plus 90? Yeah. Our loans increased by 90. So we have plus 90 now. This is right, the 90 that went out. Let's say you went to go buy a car. This was 90 that you gave to the guy who sold the car. Well, this 90 that they received, they're not going to put this entire 90 back in the bank. They are going to put some of it in the bank, but they're going to tend to carry some amount around as cash. So they're going to carry this $90 they received. They're going to carry 15% of it. So 0.15 times 90. They're going to carry around 13.5 as cash, meaning the rest. So what is that? 90 minus 13.5. 76.5 of it is going to go back on deposit. So we see in this case here, our deposits don't grow as fast. Keep in mind in our previous case, let's just jump back and take a look. This was plus 90 of new deposits. In our case here, it's now only plus 76.50 of new deposits. So as we work through that, what, uh, what happens? We get our liabilities, deposits, reserves, loans, and then they're going to balance. So we're going to have 276.50. So we're going to have 110 plus 76.50. That's going to be reserves of 186. Oh, sorry, not. What am I doing? What am I doing? I'm looking at the wrong place. Sorry. Reserves, we're at 20. This 76.50 gets added in. So 20 plus 76.50. That's going to give me 96.50. Ah, look at this. In this scenario, our reserves don't return to the 110 in each time, right? So a little bit of a difference there. Total deposit, or sorry, total liabilities, 276.50. Our loans then, well, this whole side has to equal our 276.50. So we get 276.50 minus our amount on reserve gives me my loan amount of 180 which, of course it is, that amount didn't change. All that changed was our deposit into our reserves. Okay, from here we can work it out. Again, we're going to have excess reserves. We're going to have reserves above that 10% level, so we're going to lend them out. As we lend out these extra reserves, some of it will be kept as cash. Some of it will come back on deposit. The big thing is that it's only the amount that comes back on deposit that gets multiplied, that gets lent back out, that becomes the new money, right? It's only deposit money that can be multiplied and created. So in this case here, we're not going to go through the whole process. The whole idea of this was just to show us that we have a leak in our system. This cash leaks out. It leaves our whole money creation process. And so the more cash we tend to carry, the less our money supply is actually going to explode up or explode down by given a change in our deposits or withdrawals. In this case, if we have cash, we can work out for the final situation that our change in deposits is going to be equal to, all right, that's the final change in deposits, is going to be equal to the new amount deposited. 
times our money multiplier. But in this case here, our money multiplier will be 1 over our target reserve ratio plus our cash carry rate or plus our currency ratio. So what would happens in this case? Our change in deposits is this plus 100. And then we're going to have our 10% target reserve ratio plus our 15% currency ratio. So that's going to be 100, 1 over 0 0.25. That is 100 times 4. We get a change in deposits of... 400. So we see that, hey, we have a very drastically different situation compared to our initial case. If we wanted to take a look at our final T table, let's take a look at that. So after all of this money creation has happened, right, we're spiraling, we're spiraling, we're doing all of this infinite sum. We end up over here, liabilities, assets. We've had a change in deposits of 400. So we started off with 100, we changed by 400. So my new value of deposits is 500. 100 plus 400 is 500. So 500 there. Reserves, well, I have my target reserve ratio of 10%. So 10% of 500 is gonna be 50, meaning I'm gonna have loans of 450 giving me my final T table. Difference there, we see that by having cash, we have this cash leaking out in each incremental growth as you move through, and the deposits do not nearly explode as high through this whole money creation process. We would witness the same thing, of course, in reverse through our money destruction process if we had withdrawals. The cash slows down the multiplier, makes it so it's not as large, and we have less of a money destruction process as well if money were to leave. Okay, a little bit of a thing here. What we've just worked out is our change in deposits. But we no longer, because we have cash, it's no longer the case that deposits equals money supply. That's no longer true, right? Now we have that our money supply equals deposits plus the amount of actual physical cash that we have in circulation. We've just worked out, hey, okay, our money supply one is equal to 500, but what's our new cash? Well, our new cash, we tend to carry around 15% of our deposits as cash, so 500 plus, What's well, 15% of 500? Ah, 15% of 500. So that's going to be 75. So my new money supply, money supply one will be 575. Again, if we want to compare and contrast that, what did we start off with? Our money supply originally, let's go up and take a look was 115. So we still have quite the expansion of our money supply altogether, but not nearly as drastic as our cashless scenario, where our money supply exploded from 100 all the way up to 1100. So quite the difference there. Quite the difference in this case. Okay, so we've seen with cash how this all works out. What we have to do now, we've seen our money creation. The same thing works in reverse for our money destruction. Let's introduce a few terms and then from that a few kind of equations now that we've seen the process of it. Some ways to kind of make this easier to think through, easier to calculate, so that we don't have to go through this whole creation or destruction process each time. So let's take a look at that. The two terms we want to take a look at are our monetary base. This monetary base, this is often referred to as our high-powered money. 
To be honest, this monetary base, this is what our Bank of Canada is going to be playing around with, what they're going to want to influence when they engage in monetary policy. Written as MB, our monetary base is going to be equal to all of the amount of money that our private banks, that is our financial intermediaries, are holding as reserve, plus all of our cash in circulation. So all the reserves plus all of the cash in circulation, this accounts for our monetary base, our so-called high-powered money. The other side of it is going to be our money supply. Right, and we're dealing with a cash society now, a society that has cash. And in this case here, our money supply is going to be equal to all of our deposits plus all of our cash. So again, as we've talked about in that way, as we worked through in that previous example, our new term really here is this monetary base. And in reality, it's the monetary base that's going to be influenced here. It's the monetary base that the Bank of Canada will directly influence, directly manipulate in order to have an effect on the money creation or destruction process. That is to either increase or decrease our money supply. And let's talk about that impact here. Let's just jump back and take a look that really... Even though we played around and we said, hey, look, new deposit of plus 100, this influence of this plus 100 of new deposit, the way that I purposely framed that was that it also was plus 100 to our monetary base, right? That is, in reality, if we we're talking about the Bank of Canada getting involved in doing this, it would be straight starting off in this step that the Bank of Canada is directly putting money into these, into these financial intermediaries reserves, essentially by giving them a deposit, but through this monetary base method. So from here, we can kind of look at our, we can calculate our deposits, and I'll go deposits prime is going to be equal to the value of our monetary base times one over our target reserve ratio plus our currency ratio. And right, often for a lot of people, this gets confusing. We have big C here for the amount of cash, the amount of currency we have in circulation. And we have little C here for the amount of our currency ratio. And then right on top of that, we also have big C as our consumption function and little c as our autonomous consumption. You're like, oh, there's so many Cs going on here. Context is everything to start off, right? We're talking about monetary policy. We're talking about banking. C is going to be cash. Little c is going to be currency ratio. I've also seen many people do this just to kind of help them keep it straight. They'll do C subscript R to say, yep, this guy here, this is my currency ratio, not my cash. That's fine, right? That's just a little trick to help you make sure you're using the right thing in the right place. So we can figure out our deposits given this situation. And let's test this. Let's make sure that this actually works, right? What point is this formula if it's just garbage and it doesn't give us our answers? So if we jump back, let's just take a look at our initial case before we did anything, right? In our initial case, before we did anything, we had reserves of 10 deposits of 100. So, okay, let's take a look here. We had reserves of 10 deposits of 100. We have this target reserve ratio of 10% and I'll, I'll use this notation, sure, currency ratio of 15%. Okay, we want to know what our monetary base is. Well, monetary base is reserves plus cash. Keep in mind, cash is going to be 15% of our deposits, our deposits being 100. So, okay, we can work that out as our cash is equal to 15. So, okay, what do we have all together as our monetary base? Monetary base is going to be reserves of 10 times our cash. So not times, reserves of 10 plus our cash. 
of 15, we're going to have a monetary base of 25. So, okay, based off of that, well, we're going to say our deposits are equal to our monetary base of 25 times our deposit multiplier, 1 all over target reserve ratio, that's 10%. Currency ratio, that's 15%. So, deposits equals 25 times. Or deposits equals 100. Hey, is that is that what we had? Yep, no big surprise there. That is exactly what we had. When we were at that ideal target reserve ratio of 10%, we had monetary base of 25. That's 10 from our reserves, 15 from our cash. And we can calculate what those deposits ought to be then as 100. So, okay, that, that works. That gives us our answer. Okay, but is that very useful? Is that very useful to figure out what our end scenario is? Well, no, not necessarily. Right? From here, what we could do is we could then work out what our updated monetary base is. Our updated monetary base, we added 100 to it. So our updated monetary base was 110. And then from that, we could work through. Reserves went up by, right? And that's all that we did. We just increased our reserves to 110. We didn't change our cash at all. Just those reserves. You could update that. You could throw in, okay, my new monetary base is 110 plus 15. That's 125. And then worked out what our new deposits were that way. Our other trick that we can take advantage of, if... If there's no change in our deposit multiplier, if our target reserve ratio, if our currency ratio stay constant, then we can also say that the change in our deposits is going to be equal to the change in our monetary base times our deposit multiplier. As such. So... Two, two different formulas. First guy there to give us our value of our deposits given what our value of our monetary base is. Second one, working out what the change in our deposits are given the change in monetary base. Okay, from here though, really this is not really anything too exciting. I've just essentially rephrased this bit here just instead of, hey, new deposit, I've said, hey, we're actually talking about monetary base. So I've actually given you nothing new to work on. That was rather anticlimactic. What we can also do is we can take a look at how the money supply is affected and how the money supply is affected. And similarly, instead of a deposit multiplier, we can take a look at a money multiplier. And in order to work that out, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a new guy here. And we'll say that our, we'll use blue for this. Our money supply is equal to our monetary base times what will be known as our money multiplier. Our money multiplier, that's actually going to be fairly straightforward, it will be 1 plus the currency ratio all over our target reserve ratio plus our currency ratio. Okay, so hey, let's, let's check that out again. Let's just use again these initial values that we had to start. Let's just go over these guys here, just because we can easily check that. Let's keep in mind that what did we say? We said that our money supply initial was, let's jump back and double check that. Money supply initial was 115. So let's check that this actually works. Okay, so what did we have? We have a monetary base. We already calculated that for our last case when we we're trying to figure out deposits. We have a monetary base of 25 times one plus our currency ratio. That's, that's 1.15 all over target reserve ratio plus currency ratio. We know that that denominator is 0 0.25. Okay. This term in brackets, this is our money multiplier. This is how much our monetary base is multiplied to influence our money supply. 
So our money supply is equal to 25 times. Let's work out what that money multiplier is. That's 1.15 divided by 0.25. That's 4.6. Okay. 25 times 4.6 gives me a money supply of 115, which exactly what we expected it to be. So yay, right? Our formulas are working. Our formulas are doing things properly. Again, we can do the same kind of trick like we did with our deposit formula and the deposit multiplier. That is, if we presume that our currency ratio is stable, if we presume that our target reserve ratio is stable, well, we can say that a change in the money supply is going to be equal to a change in the monetary base times our money multiplier. One plus our currency ratio all over our target reserve ratio plus that currency ratio. And so any change in this will get multiplied to result in a change in that money supply. So ultimately in this case here, we get some new money coming in to our monetary base. We can work out what the new money supply is either by working out the change or by throwing in our new updated value of the monetary base and getting directly that new value of the money supply. From there, we can work out deposits, cash. We can work out, well, deposits through this formula, and then we can work out cash based off of the currency rate, on and on and on. So a lot of ways that we can play around with this to get different values as we evaluate and analyze our economy. Okay, so bit of math going on there, bit of interesting stuff going on as to how our financial intermediaries really are the ones that create money through this borrowing, relending out, right? Borrowing, I mean, by taking on deposit, only holding so much of it as a fractional reserve and lending out the excess. Similarly, they create a destruction of money by going the other way. Well, let's talk about, we'll take a step away from the math. The math's going to be there kind of implicitly behind the scenes, but let's take a step away from the math and talk about our three main players in this money creation process and what impacts they have. How do they impact this money creation process? And really, this is going to throw in a whole bunch of fuzz, a whole bunch of uncertainty for the Bank of Canada in their attempt to influence or target a money supply. And we'll see just how difficult it is to actually influence this guy, to actually get it to grow or actually to get it to shrink. We'll see how very limited control the Bank of Canada actually has in this scenario. So let's go and jump over. Let's take a look at our three players. Three players. Okay, this is the three players. Let's actually be fully uh, explicitly clear here. The three players of our money creation process. And of course, I could write that the different way. I could take a look at it in sense of our money destruction process where we are scaling down our money supply, going the other way. Okay, our first player, our first player is our Bank of Canada. Let's try that again, Bank of Canada, there we go. Okay, Bank of Canada, what do they get to influence? And here, actually, maybe, maybe this will help. Maybe this will help. I said we're going to take a step away from the math. Let's, let's just take a look at the math here. Money supply equals monetary base times 1 plus our currency ratio all over our target reserve ratio plus our currency ratio. Okay. Right, so just we can have that just hanging out there so we can kind of see what's going on. So first player, Bank of Canada. What do they get to influence? What is their one part of this that they get to have a say in in order to influence our money supply? Well, the Bank of Canada, they have a pretty big say over the monetary base. As one of their functions was funds management, they get to influence how much cash is out there in circulation. They also get to influence how much is there in the reserves. They get to influence that monetary base. And we'll talk about how they do that later when we look specifically at monetary policy. But they get to play around with that monetary base. What does that mean? How does that change the money supply? So here we'll go. This is the determinant 
that they get to influence, and then how does that end up changing the money supply? Well, if they, uh, we'll go, if they increase their monetary base, they will increase the money supply. And of course, it's symmetric. The opposite would also be true. If they decreased the monetary base, all else equal, the monetary supply would decrease. All else equal, right? So first player, Bank of Canada, our central bank, all they get to play around with is that mon uh, monetary base. Okay, next one. Next one is our private banks, uh, our financial intermediaries. What do they get to play around with? Well, they get to play around with their reserve ratios, their target reserve ratio. They can decide, hey, you know what? We're worried about liquidity. We want to hit, carry around higher levels of target reserve ratios. We want to carry around more money as reserve. Keep in mind, this has a cost to the bank. This is money that they're not lending out. So there's that opportunity cost of that foregone revenue. But if the bank's unsure about liquidity, they may decide to carry around higher levels of target reserve ratios. So in this case here, if they decided to expand their target reserve ratio, they're holding more as reserves, they're lending out less, we have less deposit expansion. If we have less deposit expansion, the bigger that target reserve ratio, the smaller the money supply, all else constant. Okay, so we see how our financial intermediaries play into this. They can influence that target reserve ratio. They can influence how much they want to hold as reserves. Who's our last player? The last player is the depositor. So this is, this is for the most part, you and I. What does the depositor get to influence? The depositor, you and I, we get to influence our currency ratios, how much we want to carry around as cash. In this sense here, our currency ratios, um, oh, target reserve ratio up, money supply down, our currency ratio is going to have the same kind of effect, is that if we decide to carry around more cash, well, the more cash we decide to carry, is less money going through that whole multiplier, that whole creation situation. So all else equal, if we decide to carry more cash, we are gonna have less in our money supply. So in taking a look at this, what we can really see is that, okay, the Bank of Canada, their, one of their functions is to influence, to be the manager of this money supply. But we see that, Really, they're only one out of three players. They can influence this monetary base, which sure is a big part. But what happens if they just go and give the banks a whole bunch of reserves? So, hey, monetary base up should be money supply up. But the banks just take all those reserves and say, hey, great, we're just going to increase our reserve ratio. Well, now the bank gave them a bunch of money. They're just holding on to it as cash. They're not lending it out. And we don't actually witness an increase in the money supply or as drastic of an increase as we first thought. So Bank of Canada doesn't have perfect ability to really target a money supply very accurately. On top of that as well, they could go through all that. And at the same time, you and I could decide we don't trust the banks anymore. And we decide to increase the amount we hold as cash. Because, hey, cash is king. So, okay. Cash ratios, currency ratios begin to climb, money supply falls. So we see that the Bank of Canada has a role to play. The Bank of Canada can influence this monetary base, but the Bank of Canada has very limited, if any, control over financial intermediaries and what they set as their reserve ratios. And they have next to no control over you and I and how much we want to hold as cash. So we see that in this idea of targeting money supply, the Bank of Canada is very, very limited. And in being very, very limited, uh, they have a lot of trouble if they actually wanted to try to get the money supply to equal one specific thing. So what we'll see in that, what we'll see as we move on into how the Bank of Canada actually enacts monetary policy, 
They've just said, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of uncertainty. Forget about money supply. We don't care what level it's at. We're just going to let it do whatever it's going to do. Instead, we are going to bypass the money supply and we're going to focus on an interest rate. And by focusing on an interest rate, we'll allow that money supply to float. As that money supply floats, we're just going to go and buy and sell in such a way to maintain an interest rate where we want it. And you're like, how does that work? We'll get to that. That's the idea of how we're going to enact monetary policy. We'll see that in our upcoming video. For now, though, what have we covered? What have we covered today? What have we covered in this video? Okay. By the end of this, what we really should be comfortable with is the really the operations of private banks. That, hey, private banks are profit maximizing. That private banks are going to take money on deposit. They're only going to hold a fractional amount of that as reserve, lending out the excess. That through this fractional reserve banking, through banks being profit maximizing and lending out as much as they can, we have a money creation process. That it's actually these private banks, these financial intermediaries that scale up our money supply. Or alternatively, if money leaves the system, it's these financial intermediaries that scale down our money supply. So financial intermediaries, private banks, not even actors attached to the government. They are the ones who have a huge influence on the amount of money in circulation. From there, we've taken a look at a few different equations. We've taken a look at monetary base, reserves, and cash, and how we can measure the deposits based off of our monetary base, reserve ratios, and currency ratios. And we've taken a look at our money supply. We have defined it as deposits plus cash and ways to measure our money supply based off of the monetary base. And of course, changes in each one. We've utilized our T-tables to demonstrate that growth or to demonstrate that contraction. And ultimately, the big takeaway going forward is going to be our three players, the determinants they are responsible for, and how they ultimately will end up influencing our money supply or our money creation or destruction process. If you have any questions on anything we've just covered with this, please feel free to reach out to me, especially with that money creation destruction process. That's an abstract idea for many people. More than happy to go through that again. Feel free to comment below. Feel free to comment on our D2L site. And of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.